Good morning. How are you doing? Well, Monday morning, it's never going to be easy. So I thought I'd start off with something a bit uplifting and encouraging. <laughs> So originally, I'm from the Caribbean. That's what surprises everybody because you can't judge a book by its cover. Yes. So I've got a dual background in business and education. I grew up working in the hotel business uh -huh. uh, where I'm from, the Virgin Islands, I'm mostly teaching water sports. Uh, and like most people, uh, I went away for university because that's kind of how it is where I'm from. You end up going away. So I have a a bachelor's in international relations and I have a master in language acquisition and a MBA from University of St. Colin. Um, professionally, uh, as I said, I grew up in hotels, water sports, uh, restaurants, food and beverage. And um, also I'm a hurricane survivor. So after one of the hurricanes, I, got, I lost my job in the hotel as it was closed and I started in finance and uh, became a trader in the, the largest private investor in Brazilian telecoms. And that was back in the 90s. And so we traded the Brazilian telco spin-offs uh, as everything went mobile. Uh, and I was eventually stationed in Rio de Janeiro. So I lived in Brazil and there um, the company transitioned a bit. and We became the first Latin American venture capital company. Wow. So we were dedicated sourcing the whole continent based in Rio. Um, I started off doing deals in educational technology, which I learned about at the master's, but pretty soon it was just doing everything, uh, web design, security, but it was in the dot-com times of the internet boom. Um, then, um, fortunately, you know what happened in the dot-com boom. I mean, you know how that ended. So um, things went down pretty quick, um, and I was, uh, unfortunately, had to leave the country. It was a sad day, I'm very happy in Brazil came to Switzerland and did the MBA at University of St. Gallen. Since then, I started my own company, which is GMAT Zurich, um, which is a preparatory firm for MBA, masters, and also wider things, so psychometric tests, things like that, interview training. Uh, and we work with the big German-speaking universities, St. Gallen, LMU in Munich, uh, Frankfurt School of Finance in Frankfurt, University of Applied Sciences here, uh, and of course, helping private individuals uh, realize their educational dreams. You and profile you have. Uh, well, it's a, I mean, that's the two bullet point version, but there's a few false starts in the middle of it. But yeah, they are stepping stones also. Thank you, yeah. You're also a senior lecturer at University of um, Applied. Well, I am, in fact, yeah. That's part of the educational background I have. And in fact, it came through my GMAT business because they saw that I worked for, for St. Colin where I'm the founder of the test preparation system they use in their language center. So I think that's always given lots of credibility. So from that basis, I started teaching business communications in Zurich uh, at the University of Applied Sciences. Oh, nice. So yeah. tell me, as a faculty member and teaching professional, how has COVID-19 affected you and your work? You know, I can answer that in two ways, because of course I'm, I'm an employee of the Fachhochschule, but of course I'm running my own business working with the major universities. So I'm going to try and answer that in both contexts. So the first thing I can say is working with the top elite universities, um, there's been a lot of uncertainty. I think that's the first thing. And, and so I see from the point of view of the university, you have to manage the law and the government and prioritize safety and at the same time accept classes of students. Now these uh, degrees tend to be expensive. So in a way you're selling a product, but you can't really describe how it will be. Yeah. And so this has been the, uh, the, the, the sensitive point and some are doing better than others. And I think it, you can group it almost through country. For example, in Switzerland, I think we're doing pretty well in general here. I think things are pretty clear and explicit. I think the UK isn't doing very well. Um, we just had an acceptance to Oxford, the Said School for the MBA, which mm -hmm. would have been a dream come true. And the student decided to not go and to stay here in St. Gallen in oh. Switzerland. So that's an example of where the uncertainty swayed the decision. Yeah. Um, we, I had an acceptance of a client to Harvard. So we, had, we celebrated, we drank champagne. Just last week, he forwarded me the email and said, there are no in class, uh, it's, it's virtual for next semester. Oh. So it created a dilemma. And in fact, we're still in discussions. I'm helping him 
decide should he because he already quit his job and he prepared to go um the whole point you go to harvard though is to meet the other people and to be part of the community so they're just going to do it online um and so this is a dilemma and i see that because they're selling they're not selling an online program those that's another market yeah exactly and it's not like the course is cheaper because it's online either mm -hmm. so they're paying a premium and i've even seen lawsuits uh, in the u.s as a result oh yeah, um, in, in class action lawsuits. If you look at the U.S. state universities, most of them now have an online program, which mm. costs about a quarter or a fifth as much as the uh, person to person. Um, and so they're being sued by the participants saying that, well, we are receiving the online version and we're being charged for the, um, the full face to face. No, I don't want to say who's right or wrong, but I'm just saying this creates some tension um, and of course, on the point of view of the school, they feel like they have no choice. Yeah, true. Because the law says you're not allowed to have people in your classroom. Having said that, um, Harvard tends to be a leader in education. So what they decide, I'm expecting to trickle down to the other institutions. Mm -hmm. So they're, thought of, they're accepted as thought leaders. So the fact that they have no class in the fall suggests that other elite universities now, for example, uh, LMU in Munich, Mm -hmm. They won't be having classes in the fall. Oh. Mm -hmm. And um, um, we haven't made the decision at the Fachhochschule yet. Um, and that's another thing. So I think if, to, to answer your question, um, it's cast a big shadow of uncertainty, mostly in the sense of organization. Um, mm -hmm. Interestingly, I think the students have coped pretty well. Because there's always two sides of the coin. If, you're, if you don't have class, it means you've broken with the linear model. You don't have to be there and you don't have to, uh, for instance, in my courses, I'm doing them via Zoom. I'm mm -hmm. videoing them and then I'm posting the videos and indexing them. And I'm telling people, look, if you can't make it, that's fine. This is what's on the curriculum. This is what we studied. Do it at three in the morning for all I care. That's nice. So yeah, that brings to my next question. How that's, the, that's the times, yeah. So how are students taking to the virtual classes? Because there is no more that interaction. Yeah, well, you know, the first thing I realized is the strategy changes because I think the mistake is to have a, a class that's interactive and where you know people and in the same style of the classroom. So my experience now is that the, the virtual classes, it's more about... Um, going more by the book mm. and, and, and offering a different experience because I don't think people at least the students I know and I know them well so they give me a lot of feedback they tell me we don't want to participate it's a computer we just mm -hmm. want to take care of business yeah so then then it's more we can invoke multimedia and we can bring up things we do a lot of business assessment via crowdfunding kickstarter but I tell you what it's much more by the book uh, doing examples and mostly doing yeah, solutions and a bit more linear things, um, more one-to-one -one exam preparation. You oh. know, that's just the reality of it. And that's the expectation. Because okay. um, I don't think people expect the same rich experience over mm. computer. They don't want that. And they seem to want to participate passively. So yeah. they kind of stream me while I can't, I mean, I only suspect they're doing other things. <laughs> to be quite honest. Um, and so the rules change. And then, of course, in a real life situation, I would send them out if they did that. <laughs> yeah. And I would do it politely. And I would say, look, um, if you have other work to do, this is a university class is not you, presence isn't required. Hmm. Yeah. I catch people doing other presentations. I say, yeah, I know what it's like. I have a lot of work to why don't you get it caught up and join us in the last half of the class? Yeah. So who is left are people who really want to go the next mile. Yeah, um, and I think sadly that's lost a little bit. But um, the virtual model is has opportunities, and, and it breaks the linear uh, function of going to class and setting your alarm and and being there at a certain time until a certain time. Mm. So maybe that's the opportunity. But I mean, to answer your question, I think the strategy is different, and it's not about offering the same thing online, but trying to package what people want and deliver that uh, in a more concise form. Is, yeah. is how I've approached it. But, and the same goes for GMAT, by the way. Hmm. 
So I guess uh, as a learning institute, GMAT is already having virtual students from before, from early on. Well, to be honest, there was always a bit of a reluctance because I've always offered Skype and Zoom classes um, and people usually came to me because they don't want that and they want one-on-one. -on -one. Because if oh. you look at the way the market is, you have, you have online solutions at most of the major brands. Hmm. Um, but what it really means is that people who come to me tend to have busy, hard professions um, and they're professionals, whether in finance, accounting, um, and, and even more far-flung fields. And, mm -hmm. and they're on the computer like 10, 12, 14 hours a day at work. And that means they have to then go home and open up the computer and do it again. And they sort of need an in-person. Uh, uh, so that's always been the, that's the heritage of GMAT Zurich, is mm -hmm. being that person who would be animated, that would organize seminars and presentations and get people in one place. So the the COVID-19 scared me a little bit that I would be competing with things that I originally said I would never do. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it, but it, it was actually fine. At that point, there was no discussion. Oh, should we do online? Should we meet? So in reality, I have a clientele now that's far about outside of Zurich. Oh. So I had people who would say, yeah, I'd love to study with you. It's a little too far. I'm in Basel or I'm in Lucerne or I mean now people even much further away. Um, and I have a client who's in Uzbekistan, for example. Oh. Yeah. And, and in fact, I had Swiss people who were abroad who mm -hmm. found out about me on the Internet. So I had clients in Dubai um, in Germany and people who were just, uh, yeah, I had a client from, who worked at the Four Seasons in Dubai. That's nice. But, yeah, but they were quarantined. So it, it was actually very good for GMAT. Now, the advantage there is this is a, this is a type of knowledge that's very linear. Mm. You know, this is just drilling the problems and the presentations are made. So that adapts very well to a Zoom model. Yeah, true. Exactly. Better than business communications because that's one-to-one. -one, that's intense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a point in that. Yeah, now, now I have a good benchmark because while, when the outbreak really got going in the beginning of March, I was in Frankfurt teaching my course. Oh, and at that point, yeah. we suspected it might be canceled, but they said, no, we're just going to run it. We did it. As I got there, I, I started teaching maybe two, three hours on the first day, and the government closed down all the schools. So it was like there was a fire in the building, and we immediately had to leave. <laughs> yeah. And that was, of course, the kids had traveled. There, one had come from Norway, and one was, oh, they were wow. from all over Germany. Yeah, because that's heavily marketed. I mean, I'm on the website, and they do it through social media. They build in a dinner. So they really draw people from all over. So we were 20 people from all around Europe. Oh, OK. Um, and so we switched to a Zoom model, and I finished the course over Zoom. So in that way, I had a good benchmark. I mean, I said, OK, well, we did a third of it in person to person and then we did the next two thirds on zoom and then we collected feedback so that was the kickoff into sort of the virtual model for me oh that's yeah fun. thrown into the fire and the feedback was good so people said this is what was good and this is and then i could see for myself what's the difference between zoom and face to face because it was the same group and the same content mm-hmm yeah, and that's been kind of the basis. Since then, we've done uh, Zoom seminars to St. Gallen. We're mm. doing one to LMU coming up. Okay. And yeah, we're trying to plan the fall on that basis, assuming that we're doing the majority of video. I guess the students are also slowly graduating, uh, adapting to the new norm. I wouldn't say that slowly. I think it's the teachers that were slowly adapting because the students, this is their life. I mean, I have kids, by the way, and so I see for myself how they behave. You know, they're streaming. Just last night, I mean, I had to fix my son's scooter. So what do we do? YouTube, you know, found out the guy does a how-to. We're there like exactly like now. And then we went and did it. Yeah. So actually, they adapted right away, and they kind of like it because they can. They have anyway. They have multimedia setups. I mean, you can yeah. assume that. Okay, I'm from the Caribbean. One sad thing there: you can't assume everyone has internet connection and fast internet, and yeah. that's great. That's a big problem for us at home, is that it, there's inequalities that that hurt, hurt education. Um, here it's some more of a question of motivation. Mm. So you always have people who decided, okay, I'm using this as an opportunity. 
And then I always had others who said, oh, well, the world is over now. Um, my future is, is, is uncertain. Yeah. Um, I can tell you in, in the scope of GMAT and admissions consulting, it produced a big spike in business. Oh, cool. Yeah, definitely. Because the uncertainty of the economy uh, will always create a desire for education. Mm -hmm. If people feel their job is under threat, and it legitimately was in many industries, yeah. anything travel, tourism, hospitality, headhunting, staffing, yeah, except for IT and, and, and maybe food and beverage or, or, or groceries type stuff. So the result was, I think the people that I was in touch with were maybe the ones who were busy or scared or something. Uh, and they decided to push it and, and continue trying to get into school. Wonderful. So today, the June 8th is the third phase of easing the lockdown destruction, uh, restrictions. So far, it's the big guest because theaters are reopening, institutes are reopening, universities are reopening. Even the museums and libraries are reopening. How do you feel about the reopening of universities after such an extraordinary event as COVID-19? Well, I'm personally skeptical that they will reopen. And I told you why, because I'm working with the universities uh, in Germany and, and Har my sister works at Harvard, I forgot to say. No. And I'm skeptical that they will reopen is my personal view. Um, what I liked is as I was in Germany um, quite a bit before the crisis, really, I did a, a week long course at LMU. And at that point, the government was saying, OK, you need to take self responsibility and you need to inform yourself. And here's the rules. Here's the website. Here's well, who's here's the risk group. And then according to that, you need to say, are you at a high risk group? Then stay home. And if you're not, then keep going to work. I kind of like that policy because to me, to keep them closed is in, in the, for the vast majority of people, uh, an exaggeration. Mm. Young people, university age, are not in a high risk group. Mm. And now, the, if you look in Switzerland, transmission levels are very low. So for me personally, I think it makes sense to open them. Um, however, I do see from the side of the school that they have to prioritize health. Um, the argument of the Fachhochschule is also equality. And they think, okay, if it's open, certain people are at high risk and they can't participate so it's better to be closed for everybody mm. Okay. Mm, that's sort of their argument now between me and you the schools um they have an interest to be closed because virtual courses require um, less infrastructure and and there's a cost advantage yeah so one can always suppose that that's influencing the decision um, but the official line is that it's equality and health. So will it open? Let's see. Harvard will not. LMU will not. Um, mm -hmm. so, so whether they do or not, is um, I'm skeptical that that will really occur. And does it also depend upon the uh, lecturers, professors, and faculty? Well, that, you know, this is something we've been sent out as faculty um, surveys about. It depends on the material, I think. Okay. So there's, so I think it is possible to do in-person classes. The professor has to request that and to um, give a detailed rationale why that should be the case. Um, wow. When it should be not in person. I mean, the real impact is exams and that's coming up soon. And so this is in a, gonna be in an online mode. So I think this is the major uncertainty we face. Um, in that point, I would have been happy to go back to school because I think it's a little easier to manage than, than online. Because hmm. you've seen this complex proctoring software where you give up computer rights, and there's parts to me that were would have been better, but we're going to do the online model. Okay. Yeah, out of the reason of equality, if someone can't join, you anyway have to offer an online solution. So they wanted it to be a uniform experience. Hmm. So that's an important question. Really, it's okay. I see June eighth, the third phase, but in reality, I don't. I don't see that coming to pass. True. But uh, in general, how have the teaching staff taken to virtual classrooms? Are they yeah, in it's an interesting question. The first answer is I don't really know because I'm home and I know the students. And that's oh. the first thing. So I don't really know. And what I suspect is mixed. I'm, I'm, I'm imagining there's a wide range. And I'm, that's mostly through my own personal students. 
because I ask them, how is it going in the other classes? And they say, oh, some guy just leaves an assignment and they have to do it on their own. And others go the extra mile and make a home Zoom studio and, and try and educate themselves on the difference. Um, I can tell you that there's an age difference. Um, and as the, as the people are older, they tend to be, with huge exceptions, but as a generality, as they're older, they tend to be less familiar with modern teaching methods. True. Um, for example, at the Fachhochschule, I was hired to teach professors, the older ones, how to use multimedia in the classroom. So I gave a continuing education series on this. Oh. And I was expecting how to show people how to use multimedia. And some of the teachers were quite distinguished as well. Oh, okay. That's yeah, but they had a really lack of IT knowledge that really was surprising. And of course, you have exceptions but I tend to think there's probably a correlation between the age of a professor and the, the, the willingness of flexibility to move everything online quickly. We cannot also move everything online like for the mm -hmm. research part and for the applications so how do you think the uh, lab experiments or researchers were there needs to be team engagement or studies that needs to be conducted only in certain laboratories. How are they going to change? Well, I mean, as a social scientist, that's, a, that's an interesting question. So the, clearly the lab work, this has to remain fixed here, even though this computer simulations are in theory possible. You know, if people want to go to Mars and they're on that spaceship, this is kind of in a way that model. So I think it is possible, is, is the honest truth. Um, you mentioned teamwork. Well, I mean, I've had feedback from my clients who are highly trained professionals that they're doing teamwork in consultancies and it's, it's working okay, because it has to. Yeah, uh, I've had stories from my, person, my, my own clients about even operatives after the project at home. And they, they, they carry around the computer and do a, take a tour of the apartment or everyone goes to the balcony and they have a glass of champagne. Um, so I always imagine, what if we go to Mars? How would it be? And then, then ask your same questions and say, okay, now it's experiment time. Because you're in that spaceship for three years and you want to educate and grow and communicate. Could it be done? I think it could be. I mean, this is like, the, okay, a chemistry experiment. But this is all simulated now in, this, in the modern times anyway. It's a little bit old fashioned. So someone told me, okay, it's 2030 comes to 2020 mm. right now. So instead yeah. of us incrementally getting to where we would be in a decade, we're there now. Maybe that's the answer. Mm -hmm. Even though nobody is saying, I tell you, I have kids and they go to school and the schools are, have published studies and they said e-learning does not substitute face-to-face -face learning. Mm -hmm. That's the position of the Swiss public school system especially for younger ones. Older, it might arguably, depending on the, on the, the subject, but younger ones, it doesn't. Um, and that's their official position. I also have seen one of the studies where it says 40% of uh, Swiss citizens are okay working from home, okay with continuing working from home. That's... Yeah. It's interesting, this, but that's a minority still. Hmm. So 40% are okay, but that means 60% are not okay. <laughs> but nearly half of the population is okay with it. Maybe yeah, it's um, I would have predicted it to be higher. Mm -hmm. um, but then again, I mean, if you have a young family or you have a, yes. you can't predict what people, or you just appreciate the distance of work. Because I can see, man, the work comes into the home and it's hard to separate. Yeah. And the days go longer, you're never finished. There, there's not that separation. So that's the, that's the risk, maybe. Exactly. So. You are like always working. Somehow, yeah. So the risk of mini burnout, yeah, there's more to do. Students, so nearly 20% of student body in Swiss universities is international. And uh, there are theories that there will be a potential dropout in the next academic year enrollments but uh, for Switzerland most of this international or foreign students are from Schengen area like Germany France etc so will there be any impact on student enrollments because they are just the bordering countries and they are very close by 
Well, I can tell you through the GMAT, I have a good overview of this and I can tell you what's going to happen is the numbers are going to go up. Mm -hmm. There's people in threatened pos positions. This has driven people back to school. And it's also driven people to understand the future won't be the past and there's more data. So uh, many of the students now are, want to target artificial intelligence and data and analysis. Even marketing is their mm -hmm. targeting school. So on my personal experience is the numbers will go up. I don't think that the Schengen rules will be such a factor. Where I do see this as a factor is people going abroad to UK, US, and mm -hmm. Anglo countries. There the numbers will drop but i don't think it's because of the travel restrictions it's more because of the university's uh, policies and not accepting students so just to give you an example so i said harvard uh in the yeah. mba they don't accept uh they're, they're doing online classes and they're giving students the right to defer for one year so they're already saying up front we understand this isn't an, an acceptable outcome for some of you if that's the case come back in 2021 because this is going to now so you'll have deferrers that come back and you'll have a big class. Yeah. So I advise my clients to do it this year uh, and to just try and master the online model because it's anyway a growing trend. And even next, I don't know if next year being part of a, a, a much bigger class, mm. I thought maybe they could have advantages of being part of a smaller class and then also using video stuff. And then as the, as the restrictions are eased, then already moving into that model. So that was my, and also while the, the economy is a bit in turmoil, it makes sense to be in school. Just from, a, just from an economical point of view, because I mean, you want to come into a strong job market. So to graduate today, it wouldn't be so easy. Yes. So those are the considerations I see. So I would expect a spike in um applications and and also i've seen the schools accommodating these applications by allowing late cycles waiving standard tests um just a general increased flexibility wow but as you said there are students who would be opting for certain universities just because of the campus or because of the on-campus interactions or the alumni meetups that's exactly the unknown yes mm. So will that be, um, yeah, that, that's the big question here. How will that, I don't, I don't know really. I think that the, the, law, the threat of job loss and the, and the need to requalify will outweigh that is my personal view. So I think net net you will have increased enrollment. Okay. Just with the reality of a, a, a huge spike in unemployment will motivate people to go back to school. That's historically proven, dot com, debt crisis. You can, you can see that on the graphs of enrollment in universities and economic uh, output. So you also mentioned there will be changes in the entrance examinations or the uh, admission requirements. So will there be any uh, potential change in GMAT format as well? Uh, in GMAT, did you say? Yes. I missed the last part. Well, there is a change and it's, you're allowed to take it at home. Okay, that's, that's a major change. Well, the point is the ETS, which is the owner of TOEFL and, and SAT and GRE, they mm. offered an online model. Uh, mm. They compete with GMAT, so GMAT had to offer one as well. Um, I haven't heard good stories. I have a client who's taken it already twice, and it's failed both times. Oh, um, you, because yeah. of technical... Uh, technical uh, issues, yeah. And him and I have had Zooms um, for weeks. So I know his system works perfectly. Oh. Yeah. And, and for example, he'd already taken the test. He prepared heavily. He had gone through most of the test and the failure came at the very end. Oh. So then this, the score was, uh, was, was, of course, never generated. Mm -hmm. um, and it's late in the application cycle. So it hasn't gone well, at least from what I've heard from my students. There's technical issues and... So I'm counseling people to go to the uh, test center. The schools have granted exceptions um, and they've also given, they've also given different uh, conditional acceptances. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. So they've, but I don't, I don't think it'll go away, but this year they've understood it's not possible to take it. So they've been, they, I think it's Cornell, the Johnson school uh, in the U S has even 
wave GMAT when possible. That's nice. It's a once in a lifetime. Yeah. yeah I have in my sight. I'm like, guys, understand this is a once in a lifetime. If you're afraid of GMAT, get involved. This is the time. Yeah. It'll never, I don't know. I mean, unless they realize, well, the people are doing wonderfully in the school. Why do we even use GMAT in the first place? Exactly. Yeah. So that's the point. But I tend, the, the schools use, it's too, I think it's too well embedded in the system. Mm -hmm. It's part of the rankings. It's part of the overall competitiveness. So I doubt it'll go away. Yeah, this brings to my last question. Mm -hmm. So how do you see the future of education system? Uh, will it transform drastically or has it already been on the transformation journey? Mm, it's well, uh, no, I think it's lagged behind other industries. Education has been by definition much, it's been more traditional. Um, and if you look at online offerings compared to other industries, it's lagged behind. I think this is forcing it to, to, to keep up and be more innovative. I mean, okay, online classes and MOOCs and these various formats, it's nothing new but they haven't gained, they're not prestigious. They haven't gained acceptance except in niches in say, I don't know, laboratory or what should I say? Uh, accounting, for example, there's certain situations when online system is effective. Uh, so now I think it becomes, it, it goes from nice to have to must have. And it's a, it's a part of an overall flexibility. Um, so it's going to have the effect of lowering costs because it does lower the costs, mm. uh, physical presence. Um, and it's going to break the linear model. Think of how TV used to be. So you, you, you run home and you watch your story at eight o'clock. Uh, and now it looks ridiculous. Now you just on your phone, you tweet, you, you, you have an episode. So I wonder if education is going to follow the Netflix model of just a menu and you mix and match and you do it in your own time, in your own place. And the professor is more like a coach that kind of mm -hmm. enables you to do that. That's my personal vision for education. Um, the schools, interestingly, are the ones resisting that. I think the students want that because if it's flexible and cheaper and more effective, it's in their benefit. Um, and let's be honest, at the schools in traditional education, there's a fair bit of time wasting. You go there and then the professor tells something and you've already heard it or it's, it's a formality. There's lots of formalities in the, in the system. Um, and I even see that. I mean, I'm working at the elite German universities. The students tell me how it is. They say, well... The classes are seminars of three or 400 people. Wow, really? Yeah, yeah. And they're huge seminars. I tell them, okay, let's get an academic reference. They say, I never met the professor. I can't. And what do you mean? You went to school, you graduated. They're like, yeah, but the seminars were giant. And all we met is the teaching assistant. And in fact, we never went to the seminar, they might even admit. And a week before the test, we just lived in the library. Oh, yeah, and that's, I'm thinking, that's inefficiency. Then why, if you can live in the library for a week, why have the rest of the three months? So it's in a way it reminds me almost of like the taxi business before Uber. Everybody knows it's inefficient and there's got to be a better way, but then kind of it just, it just went on. Yes. But what the final product will be will, is, I'm not here to, to I can only speculate, but I'm, I'm just, like I said, I'm imagining it's going to do what Netflix did to TV. It's going to be faster, uh, less linear, more decision-based. Um, I don't know if that's a good thing, by the way, because I think the face-to-face -face interaction would be um, important. Yeah, that as well. But it's an important charismatic skill. But, um, and that, so that's what worries me personally as an educator. But I think that the business model is compelling. And when the cost advantage is such, the schools will probably start to, um, yeah, I saw that with my employer. They start to realize, hmm, it's maybe better for us if people aren't here at all. And if you look at law school, for example, there's no accredited online law school. But like for such universities, how do you think the future will be? Like for the researching uh, universities and law uh, firms? Yeah, that's the big question. Will they adapt the online model or will they say, sorry, you have to be here face to face? Um, you know, I think this is going to generate a lot of data and there'll be empirical ways to go about that and to say, okay, well, here was 
in 2015, this is how it was in 2020, this is how it was, and you can start to look at outcomes because we're speculating now. Um, but if you have two uh, experimental and control group and you can say, okay, these guys came through the uh, more of an e-learning system and they perform well in data and, and presentations, but maybe less so in charismatic uh, subjects. So that's probably the determinant, at least it should be. Yeah. If the uh, online system generated good outcomes, it should go on. And what was weak, it could fix it. Maybe it's what we do a lot is the flipped classroom model. Is, is we have the kids do the homework in class and then do the, 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 the regular work at home that we would have done. And maybe it's going to be that. It's going to be just a paradigm shift. And they'll come to school and do some interaction, do a presentation. Um, I tend to think it'll increase the efficiency. Uh, I, of course, like anything, there's winners and losers. Hmm. And I would be cautious to stake out a position only in the physical world in this age. Yeah, I don't think it's tenable in, in the year 2020 anymore. Um, but before, if you were an early mover, you were only in the virtual world and you weren't credible. Yeah. It was hard to sell those courses because this university could always say, oh, those guys, that's not the real thing. Um, but I guess the answer is once data is generated and you have outcomes and empirical evidence, and let's see which is better from just an unemotional point of view. Yeah. Let's see what generates a better outcome and let's do it. And also, unless you implement it, you never know. Yeah, right. So this forced us to implement it, and now we will know. And then we can get real feedback, and we can ask the kids who did it. We could say, was this a good experience? Did you learn? And, I mean, of course, it comes down to motivation. True. If people are determined to learn. They always will. Yeah, thank you so much for your time. I personally definitely enjoyed the conversation. It was more exciting than I thought. Oh, good. Okay. That's a relief. Yeah. Well, I mean, I feel like in a way, when you asked me these things, I felt like I'm qualified to say, maybe you disagree, but these are the real things that are going on. So, so people can disagree, but I'm just trying to share my observations. It definitely helped uh, because uh, I don't have the direct interaction with the education system mm -hmm. here, but your experience really gave me some. Yeah, I've got the students, the universities and yeah. the, the decision makers. So it's true. But in the end, I mean, there's the decisions are not always rational, not always correct either. I mean, you disagree with certain things. You know, that's yeah. life. But it sounds like our business is done. So many thanks for your uh, great interviewing skills. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Sure. Have a okay. wonderful day. And you. Bye for now. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay,